Welcome back. God bless. We're looking at the first section, the first 10 or so, 15 pages of our text, the Catechism from Mount Athos, the Mystery of Christ, my slowly beat up edition here that we're going to be going through for the next 55 or so lessons. This is the beginning. Good strength, good patience, and let's get started. There we go. Christ, the fullness of revelation. We're looking tonight at the stages of revelation and how the Lord has from the beginning made himself known to man and how he makes himself known, especially in the divine economy of the incarnation. But before that, we start with creation. And the Lord made himself known and has made, God has made himself known through creation from the beginning, from Adam and Eve all the way down to our days and continues to reveal himself through creation. God is revealed, first of all, through creation, which is the image of his glory. The beauty in the order of nature teaches us that God exists. And then he created and governs, and that he created that governs the universe. I should say before I go on that, these are preliminary notes, my translation from uh, the text, of the text. And this is what we're going to be doing over the next year and a half is slowly, step by step, 10 pages at a time, translating and presenting them to you. This is almost word for word in the text. And so they're going to be uh, not complete. This is, a, this is a draft of the, of the translation. I'm not going to be putting in all of the minute uh, sources of every quote. We're going to put the author of the quote or the source, but we're not going to put all of the uh, details of every quote because it's kind of a distraction and also would take more, much more time. But obviously in the final edition of the book, which we will publish, God willing, uh, on Commanded Press, all of, all of the footnotes will be in, in complete. All of creation reveals God is the creator. The heavens declare the glory of God as it says, moving uh, the spectator to wonder at his creator. God created the world and all that is within it, and he is the Lord of heavens and, and of the earth. See, there's all kinds of typos here because I'm literally just typing as, uh, translating and typing as I go. Nature is a kind of gospel, the natural gospel, which reveals God. Creation reveals the wisdom and the omnipotence of God, just as the statue reveals its creator, the artist. And men know God through the magnificence and beauty of his creation. From the degree of beauty of created things, their creator is likewise understood. And before we go on to the next slide, I want to just point out that this text is, um, you know, just slam packed full of patristic citations, scriptural citations. And there's barely a paragraph that does not go by in which he's, the authors are citing the Holy Fathers. So we have at the end of the book, <clears throat> 110 pages or so, or 115 pages or so of, uh, of uh, footnotes and references uh, out of the 700 or so pages in the book. So this is one of the great uh, benefits of the book is that we're not having a, a contemporary author sit and, and muse and speculate, but we're having one after another of the of the fathers and a few contemporary theologians adding their voice uh, to the uh, uh, to the catechism. From the created things, man who is fashioned in the image and likeness of God is led by his intellect or his noose. This is what when I translate intellect here, I'll usually put the word noose translation, the Greek term noose next to it to distinguish it from the rational intellect, the dianya in Greek. So. Unless uh, I forget, or unless we're talking about the dianya, I'll try to always put noose, but in case I don't, intellect should be referring to the noose. And that is the, uh, the, the not the rational, but the spiritual part of man. The, 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 the noose is the organ of communion with God. So it's, it's very significant because in, in English, unfortunately, we have lost, largely lost the distinction between the Dianya and the noose, or the mind, or the rational mind, rational intellect with the spiritual intellect, let's say. It's, it's even difficult to translate uh, 
to be understood by most English speakers. <coughs> so again, from created things, man who is fashioned in the image and likeness of God is led by his intellect back to God. Man, even though he sinned and fell away from God, nevertheless had knowledge of God through his wondrous creation. And is, as it were, lived and moved and had his being in God. The knowledge that God exists had been implanted by nature in all of us, by God himself, as according to St. John the Damascene. Of course, the knowledge of God is proportionate to the purity of man. Without purification, we are bereft of the knowledge of God. So that it's implanted, but if you fill your soul, as it were, with garbage, it's going to be buried. And you can definitely live this life, as unfortunately many people do today, uh, with the rise of, of atheism. They can live this life without acknowledging that which has been clearly given to us by God from, from the get-go, from being created in his image and likeness. Along with creation, which shows forth the perfect artist creator, divine providence over the entire creation likewise, likewise reveals God. So we have creation itself. We have God implanted in each one of us as, as his creation. We have now the divine providence over the entire creation, which likewise reveals God. Providence is the relation of God toward all beings, which are the recipients of the care which is shown by him, St. Gregory Palamas. Providence is the common, natural, and essential activity of the triune God. The providence of God is uncreated and pre eternal because all was foreseen by God and all was foreordained eternally, even though he brought them forth in their due time. Now, St. Gregory Palamas was writing this 600 years ago, and he had no part, no problem saying pro orde in Greek, which is translated here as foreordained, because the cacodoxy of Calvinism did not exist. Today, we have to stop and say, this does not mean he predetermines and takes away man's will. Foreknowledge and the term pro orisi to foresee or to could be foreordain does not imply the uh, removal of the free will of man in any way. But God, who sees all time, as it were, in the present, who is outside of time, who sees everything that is happening as if it's already happened, right? He can see and he can therefore providentially arrange for our salvation the best possible outcome, respecting always our free will. So the providence of God also shows forth the revelation of God. So we're talking about the stages of revelation, creation, man's own being created in the image and likeness of God and having within him from God this knowledge that he exists, that he is the creator of heaven and earth. And then we have the providence of God. His own care for his creation shows forth is a kind of revelation to man about God, who he is. Moreover, the goodness of God is revealed within creation. Thus, God shines his sun on the wicked and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust, according to Matthew 5.45. Likewise, that which the Apostle Paul characterizes as invisible but perceived within creation are revealed. He says in Romans 1.20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, invisible and yet perceived. I say that to many of our atheists today. They don't see the invisible, which is percept perceptive, it's perceivable in creation. In other words, the omnipotence, the magnificence, and the wisdom of God, that which is invisible, is yet apparent in creation. And this is a revelation of God. This is the so-called natural revelation, which proceeds and is less perfect than the supernatural, acting, as it were, as the forerunner and pedagogy for the supranatural revelation. So we have a forerunner before the forerunner. We have all of the natural revelation, providence of God. Uh, telling us who God is, saying something about the, the, the existence and the love of God. The supernatural revelation comes about through prophecies, promises, miracles, types, and symbols, 
we're going to go through all of those. So much of the Old Testament we're going to be going through is all about the prophecies, promises, evdokias, the miracles, types, tipi, and symbols. According to his nature, of course, God is infinite and incomprehensible for the human intellect, the noose. Man can understand on, only one thing, the infiniteness and incomprehensibility of God, according to St. Gregory the Theologian. That is what we can understand. What? That he is infinite and incomprehensible. Even among the archangels, angels, principalities, dominions, and powers, and generally among all of creation, the triune God is, according to his essence, unsearchable, unseen, incomprehensible, and invisible. This is according to his essence. As we'll see, he reveals himself and acts through his divine energies. Consequently, therefore, because it is difficult to conceive of God and to speak of him, therefore, divine mercy has not left man entirely bereft of the knowledge of God through the various revelations, including, of course, the present throughout all of the Old Testament, prophecies, promises, miracles, types, and symbols. Furthermore, the beginning of the, in the beginning, the remembrance of communion with God remained with the human race. However, the passions and the falling away of men from God led them into idolatry. So again, the remembrance of communion with God remained with the human race. There was a remembrance that some, at some point we had communion in the garden with Adam and Eve. It remained, it passed down, passed through generation upon generation. What happened, though, is that not having the grace and the communion with God, man inclined toward the lower, the earthly, the fleshly, the passions that which he suffers from. He became a slave to them. He suffered under the weight of them, and he fell away from God. And this then led him into idolatry, which is the ultimate delusion, right? The ultimate denial, the ultimate degree of separation from what he had initially given us in paradise. Nevertheless, in the old covenant, there were righteous and patriarchs and prophets, which on account of their purity had the true knowledge of God. So God did not remain absent from his people, God forbid in the Old Testament. On the contrary, he had the righteous, the patriarchs, the prophets, who because they struggled to be faithful and remain pure and did not follow the general inclination toward the past, did therefore entertain idolatry, they had true knowledge of God insofar as that knowledge was available to them. This knowledge of God and communion with God took place according to the common triune divine energy. God spoke to them and revealed himself to them. As Father John Romini says, in the Old Testament, Christ revealed himself asarkos, which means fleshless, before the flesh, the pre-incarnate logos, in other words. And in himself, he revealed the Father through the Holy Spirit to the prophets, his friends. More than others, he revealed his name to the God-seer Moses, along with his plan. And he spoke with him face to face and gave him his law. And it says, characteristically in the patristic commentary on Moses, that he saw, the, the Lord said he could not see him, his face, he could not see, that is, his divine essence, but he could see his backside, that is, he passed by and he saw his divine energies. That's how that's interpreted. So the face-to-face -face here does not go to his essence, of course, but to his divine energies, his operations, his presence, his providence, and, and everything else that Moses communed with. In, before the incarnation of the Logos, which was the Logos himself, of course. He was communing with the Logos himself. In particular, the Logos himself is revealed as the angel of God, the angel of God or the angel of great counsel, whereby the invisible God takes on in some way a sensible form. In this communication with men, God speaks and appears by condescension such as it becomes possible for them to accept him and understand him. St. John Chrysostom writes, We speak of condescension when God does not appear as he is, but rather shows forth analogous with the receptivity of him who sees him, adjusting his appearance according to the weakness of those receiving him. So 
this is very interesting and instructive for us. Many times men will, human beings will not understand, not see, and blame God or reject God because of the limitation of their own vision. But they do not understand it's their own limitations, their own passions, their own pride, which is limiting them from experiencing God. And he appears insofar as they will allow him, insofar as they are prepared to receive him, insofar as the weakness, according to the weakness, it says, of those who are receiving him. This is very good to remember, lest we get puffed up and think, as many people say, unfortunately, during times of trial, where is God? Right? Why is God not with me, et cetera, et cetera? How otherwise? The, the, the humble man, this is how the humble man will see the limitations, not on God's side, but on our side. How otherwise, the author's right, would it be possible for men to communicate with the invisible God, if not with this condescension of God, according to our weakness? For this reason, divine scripture condescends and presents God as speaking with us according to our human ways and our human weakness. It is said that God walked in paradise in the cool of the day. However, God does not walk. He was not walking. For how is it possible for he who is everywhere present and fills all things to walk? Rather, he planted this idea within Adam in order to effect his return. By his divine providence, he showed to Adam this. But he is not limited. He's not a man walking in the garden, according to St. John Chrysostom. All that is said within Holy Scripture, describing God in a human form, for example, he heard, he became angry, he walked, he planted, he is unworthy of the unspeakable nature of God, but in harmony and appropriate for our own weakness. So again, as a part of the condescension of God, he appears, he speaks in, in, in terms of the Old Testament, in terms, in terms of the economy of God. He is, he is, becomes, quote unquote, angry and all the rest. This is one of the, uh, the areas in which the more fleshly oriented man will look at the expressions in the Old Testament and be scandalized, or the events in the Old Testament be scandalized, because they do not have an understanding of the spiritual uh, nature of, of God and how he works and speaks and in, interacts. They don't understand this principle of the condescension of God, and they think that this is rather childish, perhaps, and foolish. But it is for our our weakness that these things are said, spoken of, and our weakness that he comes uh, and appears as he does. And thank God he does. After having appeared in different forms to those of old who were receptive to the revelation of the fleshless logos, he then took on flesh and appeared to men and revealed triune divinity. So this is the last of the section we're calling the stages of revelation. And we now enter the area of uh, the incarnation and the taking on of human flesh. So before we go to the next section, Christ, the fullness of revelation, let's recap. We can discern three types or ways of revelation. First, within creation, the providence and goodness of God. This is, an indirect, this is the indirect revelation of God, that which is manifest through his works and verified through the bodily senses, according to St. Nectarius of Hagenia. The second type or way of revelation is through the righteous and prophets of the Old Testament, through which he appeared in a concealed manner, usually as the angel of the Lord or the angel of great counsel. And the third is his direct self-revelation with the incarnation of the Logos. And the word became flesh, or the Logos, Sarx, again, as it says in Greek. The prophets, of course, and the righteous spoke of him, prophesied about him. We're going to go very deep into all of that typology, all of those prophetic utterances in the Old Testament. It's going to be phenomenal. But most of us have never received this kind of catechism. And then he became flesh, which revealed the mystery of the triune God. It says in Hebrews 1.1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners 
spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these days spake, spoken unto us by his son. So three stages, creation, providence, and goodness. Second, righteous, the prophets, the Old Testament, the, the types, the symbols, and all the rest. And the third, the incarnation of the Logos. And he comes and dwells among us. And he is the fullness of revelation. We await no other savior. There is no one who's going to come and save. There's no Messiah for the Jews who are still waiting tragically and did not understand their own savior who came and dwelt among us. There's no other. It is Christ. He is the fullness of revelation. He's the fulfillment of the prophecies, the hidden mystery, the fullness of revelation, the Old Testament revelation through symbols, types, prophecies, and theophanias, that is like epiphanies of God, has its completion now in the incarnation of the Son and Word or Logos of God. Incarnation is the completion. The incarnation is the inc completion of revelation. God in Trinity appeared with the incarnation of the Logos. This event is the par excellence theophany within history. The revelation to Christ surpasses all previous revelations. Christ offers the total and perfect revelation. As he says, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. The arrival of Christ removes the curtain that had divided us, the, the dividing wall between us and God and illuminates the shadows, the darkness that we sat in, that it says, as it says with regard to the, the coming of the Savior and the fulfillment of the prophecies on the Feast of Nativity, those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. As St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, as no one could see the face of God and live, the Son assumed the face of humanity, became man in order that he might gaze upon that we might gaze upon his person. And so this is the, the, the aim of everything that came before. All of the types, symbols, prophecies, theophanias, all of the guidance of the people of old, the, the people of Israel, all of that which brought forth the Panagia, the Most Holy Theotokos, which was to what? Bring forth this, the incarnation, and that we might gaze on the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Logos. In, in, in flesh. The revelation of God was especially served and furthered by the Theotokos. It's so hard to underestimate, it's impossible to underestimate really for us because we can't conceive what the Theotokos means for all of humanity. Uh, we will, of course, talk about that in the future here in this course. By his birth from the Virgin, the invisible God became visible to man. The Logos incarnate, the ninth ode canon of the resurrection. Indeed, the beginning of the, of the revelation of the mystery of Christ and his incarnation is his birth from the Virgin. The word incarnate teaches theology, and he hath declared and revealed to us the Father and the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the one divinity. Whatever was a mystery for the Old Testament has become the preaching of the New Testament. God, however, remains a mystery, even when he is seen and perceived. So even when he becomes man, the mystery of the old now is preaching, is preached in the new. Even so, he is a mystery to us, even after his revelation, which is a, which is, of course, has to be the, if you think a little bit about it, you'll see that it has to be the case. Obviously, God cannot be understood with the human intellect in the least. There were ancient heretics who supposed they could pierce in to the essence of God and know God uh, and the mystery to be uh, revealed to the, such a degree that they would no longer be a mystery. They would understand God with their human intellect. Like these, of course, heretics were grossly deluded. And in fact, there are some today in our, in our day that have such ideas uh, about the mystery that it can somehow be uh, totally... Uh, revealed to them, uh, but this is not possible. Even when the preaching 
is making manifest the incarnation and the God is now person to person available to us. For God is neither entirely revealed nor entirely hidden. God was revealed through Jesus Christ and yet he remains hidden. For the divine is not entirely apparent, but neither is it entirely hidden, according to this writer, Kalistos Katafiotis Angiliudis. It is not entirely uh, revealed, and neither is it entirely hidden. Whatever exists, he says, is apparent, and indeed very clearly so. What, what it is, however, in other words, the essence, this is hidden. It's quite different for us to know what God is and for us to know that he exists. In other words, we have a revelation of his person in the Trinity, for instance. For the latter is made manifest by the energy or operation of God, the divine energies, the uncreated energies. While the former, the former refers, refers to his essence, which upon which upon even the angels cannot gaze, right? So that is beyond and always will be. And they mocked uh, heretics, certain Arians, for the idea that they could somehow know it. Indeed, this is St. Gregory Theologian. Indeed, even to the angels, God was invisible. St. John Chrysostom. Even to the angels, God was invisible. It was the, the angels did not see God until he became man, with the exception of his glory. They saw his divine glory, but not until the incarnation was the person revealed. He was revealed and made apparent when he put on flesh, such that together with us, the angels saw the Son of God, he who they previously had not seen, St. John Chrysostom. Even so, the mystery of the Son remains unapproachable. Again. And it is impossible for us to perceive it without a revelation on the part of the Father. The Father reveals the Son, and the Son the Father. And the Son glorifies the Father, and the Father the Son. This is the relationship. And, God, and the Lord says, unless the Lord, Father uh, sends and brings to me. So it's the mystery of the revelation personally throughout history of each to each one of us continues to happen on a per person state case by case basis the father is revealing the son to the world to each one of us likewise the holy spirit also announces the son and glorifies him of course we we say we cannot call upon god with, if it's not in the holy spirit he says in scripture so the holy trinity inseparable is working out the salvation of the revelation of the person of God in time and space, and altogether, of course, common energy of the Trinity. The most essential revelation of the incarnate Logos is his identity with the Lord of glory. Okiros is doxis, as it says in Greek. The Lord of glory is identified with the incarnate Logos. Very important, this identification, as you'll see. Christ is he who as the fleshless logos, in other words, pre-incarnate logos in the Old Testament, showed forth his glory and was being revealed throughout the period of the Old Testament. He who, when he became man and taught, was not recognized by the rulers of this age, and therefore they crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2.8. Apostle Paul identifies the crucified one as the Lord of glory precisely to show that Christ was crucified, the Christ that was crucified is the same God who revealed his glory then to the angels and to those in the Old Testament and on Mount Sinai. And this is, and thus he is called the Lord of glory. So this identification is very intentional on the part of Paul to tell the Jews and all, the, all those who are becoming Christians, this is the one and same God of the Old and New Testament. This is the one and same uh, angel of great counsel, the Logos, who spoke to all the prophets. And there, this is also relevant uh, in the days of the early church, but also today, where you have heretics who believe that somehow the Old Testament God is some other God, or it's an unjust God, and the God has to be rejected. Indeed, there are very, very bright people, 
who have done tremendous translation work for the church who have fallen into this trap, apparently falling away from Christ because they could not reconcile the Old Testament to Christ, which is a which is a tragedy. I hope uh, that they can watch this series and buy the book when it comes out to see just how it's, how it's all united. And there's the same God revealed again and again, different stages in different ways. Now, we're in the characteristics of divine revelation. This is number one of about seven, eight. And then we're going to open it up uh, a little, to uh, some exchange. If people have some questions, I can maybe get to one or two before we go to the question and answer session. As I'll remind everybody here, before we go any further, that in the description, should be on all of our the platforms, in the description is the link to the question and answer session. So if you want to join us after this lecture, which will end promptly at 7.30, uh, that is our time here. In other words, one and a half hours in. We're now 38 minutes in. So in one and a half hours in, we'll end this live stream and go in 10 minutes to the question and answer session. You can join us. Question, the link is underneath uh, on the various platforms that we're going to be doing that, and that is Instagram, YouTube, orthodoxethos.com, and uh, Crowdcast. And uh, uh, it's. I know we're streaming to eight different platforms right now, including Telegram and Instagram and Rumble and Facebook. But the question and Twitter, but the question and answer session will only be on those four platforms: OrthodoxEthos.com, uh, Crowdcast, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, for those who are members, so. We'll answer, if we have time, one or two questions here, but the rest will be answered uh, during the question and answer session. So now we're looking at the part three of this first section and its characteristics of divine revelation. Christianity, he says, the authors say, is not a religion. I think everybody who's spent a little time on our channel, but really across Orthodox catechism, this should be stressed. This should be understood. When it says that it's not a religion, although many people think it is, especially non-Christians, and maybe many Christians call it a religion, it is mistaken and if we understand it properly. In other words, in this context, we're talking about religion as a revelation of man. In other words, not a revelation of God himself, but of man's attempt to ascend and understand. So we have various prophets, so-called, of the religions. And we have various religions of the world which have not received a revelation from God, but have attempted to ascend, or they have a prophet who claims to have had a uh, revelation from God. These are false prophets and false religions. But so religion here it means not revelation, but this human centered and human sourced uh, religious practice all right so there's different ways we can use the term some are positive most in our in this context it's negative uh and so it's christianity must not be understood as a religion at all but as revelation and the the religio here the connection is not between human beings but between man and god right that's the connection and so it de differs entirely from all the religions that connect men between themselves but does not, not connect, connect them to the one God who revealed himself, and that is Jesus Christ. And the revelation of God in Christ has certain special characteristics. Let's talk about these now. Three special characteristics of the revelation in God. If we have any questions, uh, Justin, make sure you star them, and we can also, if we don't get to them, we'll answer them in this question and answer session. First of all, revelation happens on account of the love of God toward man. This is, this is the basis, right? Everything that God did for us, all the revelation that he showed to us, whether they be types, symbols uh, in creation or whether it be with the incarnation, they all are based on and come out of and flow from the love of God. And everything he did, everything he did, in his economy of salvation was for us and our salvation because he loves us. So absolutely 
basic and key and essential here is the love of God toward man. That's how it happens. And so any God that you have that is an angry God, desires punishment and all these things, we don't know that God. We don't know that God. We, we know a God that desires the salvation of everyone that's coming to the world. Salvation meaning restoration, wholeness, return to communion. So this God, this love of God toward man, who on account of his fall and ignorance was unable to find God and remain in communion with him. It was impossible. There had to be a, a God come become man. Man himself could not return to paradise. He could not ascend to heaven. Only one ascended, they, the one who came down from heaven. He alone has ascended. So he alone can bring us the revelation and restore us to communion. It is impossible for the one who loves to hide himself from the one who is loved by him. I mean, he's an object of love, right? So thus, the revelation of God is a consequence of his love for us, his goodness. That's the first thing. First characteristic. Second characteristic of the revelation of God in Christ is that this is a revelation of a personal God. It is personal, and he is a person. He is not the uh, impersonal essence. Uh, he is not a uh, far-off deity, a clockmaker in the sky, none of this, right? He is a person who said famously, evoi me, or, and that's in modern Greek, I am. I am. The thing was, I am of, of the Old Testament that Christ repeats about himself, and not an impersonal power. This person imparts his revelation to men through his chosen vessels, the patriarchs and prophets, with the final destination and recipient being the whole of humanity. So all of that which happened in the Old Testament had its ultimate goal, the whole of humanity. No one, no tribe, no language, no country, no nation, no one on the face of the earth is outside of the revelation and, the, and the, uh, uh, the providence of God for salvation. And this answers one of the great heresies of our day, which is called perennialism, which supposes that Christianity is made for and generally restricted to a particular portion of humanity. And that there are other religions given for other portions of humanity. This is an outright and utter heresy that cannot be accepted if you want to be an Orthodox Christian. There is no one on the face of the earth who is not called to communion in Christ Jesus. There's no one. And so this is the ultimate aim of the entire economy and all of the revelations, the entire of humanity embracing their creator and their redeemer and their savior and the one who ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Revelation takes place incrementally over the length of ages until its completion. Revelation, which began in the Old Testament, was completed and arrived at its ultimate point with the incarnation of the word of God. The word Jesus Christ is the fullness of revelation. So step by step, we arrive at the fullness. Again, that's an answer. These are simple things. So some, some of us might well, this is very simple. Father Peter is presenting simple things, but actually the implica implications are massive. So just that little th uh, statement we just made, that Jesus Christ is the fullness of revelation and everything ends with Jesus Christ. So the logo sarx again, that is, that is there's nothing from that point on, there's no logos that's working in spite, outside of that in Sarcomenos Logos, right? The incarnate Logos now, unto the ages of ages, sits at the right hand of the Father. He's the one that is working throughout all, all creation. There's no division between the Logos now and the Logos incarnate, right? The word incarnate. That is another cacodoxy of contemporary universalism and perennialism. The idea that, well, we believe in Christ, and, the, and as Christians, we can be perennialists because we believe that's the Logos that's working in all the various religions to bring people to God, but not to Christ incarnate. But it's Christ incarnate who will judge. It's Christ incarnate who, whose body we must be members of. 
So this is another gross heresy that we need to be cognizant of. And so as you're listening, you might think, well, this seems pretty straightforward, but actually the implications are great if we pay attention. Number three here in this series, this last sort of section, characteristics of divine revelation. God was revealed throughout the ages, continually and repeatedly. So far from him being absent among people in the world, far from him being indifferent, people might think that in the Old Testament, but well, the pagans were he was indifferent. No, he was never indifferent to anyone, no matter where they are in the face of the earth, no matter what religion or society, he's not indifferent to them. He's constantly trying to bring people to him and revealing himself. And he did it continually and repeatedly, and not once and for all. He led his people. He led his people, it should be led. He led his people from truth to truth. There were many forms and a variety of stages in Revelation. It was, however, always God himself bringing the Revelation, and his ultimate message was always the same. This identity of the message and its unity is clear in the various texts in spite of the variety of forms, Father George Florovsky. So that's very important as well. So some might say, well, there are many stages of Revelation, and therefore we could also posit something like perennialism posits, which is uh, that these various religions were stages of God's revelation. Therefore, they're somehow a part of the economy of salvation, these religions, in spite of them being idolatry or rejection of Christ. Uh, Islam rejects Christ's divinity. Uh, Judaism rejects Christ's divinity. Uh, the various Eastern religions do not accept the incarnation uh, of the Logos. And so uh, it's very important to understand that the identity of the message in all those forms uh, and all those uh, stages is the same. It's the same person, the Logos, the Word, God, the Trinity, working and speaking through the prophets and apostles and all the rest, right? And it's unity. It's unity. There's a unity of identity, unity of message. It's not uh, a uh, any kind of inconsistency, which would necessarily have to be the case uh, in terms of, you know, esotericism, uh, because we're not we don't make this sharp distinction between the esoteric and exoteric when we have a God that's become incarnate and taken on flesh. This is the this is the center of everything, right? And this is the cross upon which many will refuse to be crucified. And they cannot be Christians without this crucifixion of their intellect. And so many proud and arrogant uh, academics and speculative theologians and philosophers today, they cannot make progress. They do not understand because they refuse to crucify their mind on the, in, on the cross of Christ and the incarnation and the, uh, the implications of the incarnation. With the revelation and self-manifestation of his Trinitarian nature and his glory, God is not manifest entirely, but always withholds something hidden, and indeed retains entirely hidden his transcendent face. In the Greek there is opsi, which I've translated as face, but it could also be maybe visage would be another way to say that, but that's kind of a, no, a lot of people don't know that. And so the same means the same thing, basically. So the transcendent reality, the transcendent face of, of God is hidden. And that's, of course, talking about his essence. Whatever is called hidden must necessarily have something that is apparent, which would declare hiddenness. If this is not the case, then it is like unto non-existence. In other words, that which is not, if there's not a manifest side of something uh, which is hidden, that hidden would mean necessarily a non-existence, right? That's what he's saying here. It's a very interesting thought. The, the partial revelation of God shows forth all the more the hiddenness of his mystery. So it does not in any way somehow undermine or lessen the mystery of God, his incarnation, that is, does not in any way undermine this. St. Maximus the Confessor says, because God in relation to himself is always mystery, according to the essence, he emerges from his natural hiddenness so much as to make it all the more hidden 
by his manifestation. That's that's quite a lot to, to, to draw in, but very interesting. Let's read it again. Because God, and I hope I'm making a faithful translation here. This is a difficult translation. Because God, in relation to himself, is always mystery. According to the essence, he emerges from his natural hiddenness so much as to make it all the more hidden by his manifestation. Basically saying some of what Kaalistos above said earlier, if you want to go back and look at that, and when you you know review view this if you're watching it on uh, on replay. In the Old Testament, God was hidden within the mystery, and whoever saw his face died. No one, it says, saw his face and lived. In the New Testament, God is revealed in Christ, and now whoever does not see his face dies. Let me repeat that. Show you how stark the difference between the old and the new, the fulfillment, the, the, the type and fulfillment, right? In the Old Testament, God was hidden within the mystery, and whoever saw his face died. Even Moses didn't see his face, right? Moses saw his backside, as it says. In the New Testament, God is revealed in Christ. He's no longer hidden, he's revealed. The mystery is revealed. And now, whoever does not see his face, dies. What is death? Spiritual death is not to commune with God. That's what seeing his face means. To commune with, to be in the same space, place, to have communion. So whoever does not have communion with God, does, never, never, does not see him as he is and as, as he's revealed himself, as we have him in the church, as we have him in all the aspects of the body of Christ, it shows forth Christ spiritually and in other ways. Whoever does not have this dies. In other words, does not have life within him. And he says, the Lord says this in many ways. With the incarnation of the Logos, the content of his revelation is given by Christ to the apostles. And the church, in continuation, is the guardian, preacher, and the interpreter of revelation. Where are our friends, the Protestants? Pay attention to what we just said. You cannot know. You cannot understand and interpret revelation without and outside of the church. The church, the body of Christ, the continuation of the incarnation, right? The continuation of the apostolic presence and work is the guardian, the preacher, and the interpreter of revelation. This is how we're going to come to know God. Outside, we cannot know. Tertullian famously said, I love repeating this because it's so important today, the heretics do not have the scriptures. They do not belong to the scriptures. The heretics do not have them, and the scriptures do not belong to them. Only the church has them, and only the church can interpret them. And outside of that interpretation, they're a closed book. You can gain certain lower level basic uh, understandings, but you will not experience what you're reading unless you're in the church. You will not understand fully what is being revealed if you're not in the church. And therefore, all these levels of, of depth are, are they're cut off from, and they make terrible, terrible errors like dispensationalism or the various Pentecostalisms and all the rest. There's gross errors committed by those because they do not they do not understand they cannot understand they cannot interpret without the church revelation in christ is of itself whole and total as divine and in itself sufficient let me read that again revelation in christ is itself full and total as divine and in itself sufficient it is not however imposed by force Rather, it is presented for the free reception on the part of man. So, inquisitions, forced conversions are anathema. Anathema to the Church of Christ. Anyone who's arrived at that is far from Christ. Another witness against the papal Protestantism that there was such a thing as an inquisition. And not from only the political or the military or the governmental authorities, but with great participation of the clergy. So a gro gross departure here. It cannot be forced. It must be given and presented and freely received. And here is something that's very well put. Listen to this. It is not triumphalist 
and imposing, but rather mysterious, silent, and a paradox. It does not provoke an external fear, but rather an internal alteration, a metamorphosis, a transformation within. Right? The relation in Christ, the presence of Christ, is not triumphalistic, it's not imposing. It's mysterious, silent, it's a paradox. It's not, it's, external fears have nothing to do with Christ. When you have all these, during COVID, you had all these external fears that was of the devil. That does not come from God. He has rather an internal deep alteration which leads to faith and to obedience to the divine will and to love. All right, so are we Christians? Are we in Christ? We're going to see faith, obedience to the divine will, and love as the fruit of his presence within us. And we're not going to be fearful of anything. Even if they come to kill us and take our body and kill us, we're not going to be fearful because they have within us the kingdom of God. The faithful one sees God in the spirit and feels his presence within him. According to the word of the Lord, I will make my abode with you. This participation is linked to right knowledge of the divine will and its implementation. So people say, I have people will say, I have Christ, I have Christ within me, I feel Christ within me. Okay, that will mean that we have knowledge of his divine will and its implementation in our life. That's the fruit of his presence within our life. If somebody is telling you, I have Christ, I have Christ, I have Christ, Christ is here, Christ is there, as it says, the Lord says about the last days, don't believe him unless you see the divine will. The knowledge of divine will, which means all of the economy of salvation, the, the, the church's experience of the economy of salvation, and its implementation, uh, and that's an ongoing present, right? The implementation it has does not end uh, you know, soon. It's a lifelong implementation, but it's happening. And again, the fruit is faith, obedience, and love. That's going to be the fruit of the divine revelation. And Communion with the incarnate one. Let's see. I think I went back instead of forward. There, right? Six, we should be, shouldn't we? Yes. First, first came the pronouncement of the divine revelation through the living voice. First came the pronouncement of the revelation through the living voice, and afterwards there followed the writing of the books of Holy Scripture. Here again, directed to all of us who are from this Protestant West and the Protestant mindset, listen carefully, because some of the assumptions of some Protestants are going to be totally overturned in this page right here. So first, the living voice, afterwards, the writings of the books. Divine revelation is closely connected to Holy Scripture. However, it is also Distinguished from it. It is also, should be is, it is also distinguished from it. All right. So it's closely connected, but it's distinguished from it. The scripture and divine revelation. The divinely inspired Holy Scripture does not constitute revelation itself. What is it then? It's the God built treasury in which it was deposited. So God built treasury. That's what the Holy Scriptures are. And in that treasury is deposited revelation. It is not, however, identified revelation. Okay, The words on the page, the actual book in our hands, that is not divine revelation. That is a God-built treasury in which divine revelation is found, is revealed, is 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 is. is seen so to speak right so it does not identify one of those the source of the christian truth is not some holy text or books written by human rational intellect but the revelation of god is the uncreated energy right the source of christian truth is the revelation of god which we said just now is not the actual book the book is the treasury of it but it's not the actual book it's the revelation the source of Christian truth is the revelation of God, his uncreated energy. In other words, the uncreated energy of God, his, his own operations, actions in time and space, that is the source 
of divine revelation. Seems pretty simple, but yet these things have implications. Holy Scripture and Holy Jewish are not sources of divine revelation. Let me repeat that because there are not a few people who don't understand this. Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition are not sources of divine revelation. What are they? Created bearers or created records. Hipomimata is the Greek, a little difficult to translate. Created bearers, like God bearers. We talk about the saints being God bearers. Well, these are bearing God as well. Holy tradition and holy scripture. They bear God. They're not sources of it, though. Okay? That's a little different, but very important. Holy scripture is not revelation, but a word about revelation, a word regarding revelation. At one and the same time, scripture is the unique criterion of authentic revelation, and revelation is not limited only to scripture. All right. So at one and the same time, scripture is the unique criterion of authentic revelation. Unique criterion. You can't, without scripture, you lose that unique criterion of authentic divine revelation. But revelation is not limited only to scripture. Of course, this should be obvious to all Orthodox Christians. It should be something that the Protestant uh, is challenged by, I would suggest, I would suppose, and should seriously consider revising their obsession with the actual scriptural text without understanding it has a context. And it has, that context is Christ himself, his divine energies, and that happens in the body of Christ. That's the context in which you have to understand and which you, you, you uh, have in order for that criterion to point to and, and to, be, to be a conduit for divine revelation. With Pentecost, revelation was fulfilled. So a part of the whole economy of salvation, extension of the incarnation, of course, throughout history. Uh, we said earlier, with Christ, it's completed. But with Christ, what does that mean? It's completed. It's not with completed with his first uh, incarnation as if he left us orphans, right? He continues with us. And he continues in the church. And he says, I'm where two or three are gathered, I'll be with you. I'll guide you in all truth. He came, he said, his Holy Spirit. He was present, of course, at the Holy Trinity, all was on the day of Pentecost. And he is continuing with the church. And he will be there. And of course, at the second coming, all will be fulfilled. So it's not a contradiction to say that with Christ, everything was complete. And yet with Pentecost, revelation was fulfilled because there's no distinction, there's no dichotomy there. The Holy Spirit, during its lighting upon the disciples, in other words, epiphytesi in Greek, which is coming down on the holy apostles, on the day of Pentecost, did not reveal new dogmas. All right, so on the day of Pentecost, we didn't have new dogmas revealed. Very important because some people think, for instance, that at the ecumenical councils, new dogmas are, are, are thought up and revealed to people. Like, there could be a new dogma such as the infallibility of the Pope that nobody's ever talked about. Not possible. There were not even new dogmas on the day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Enlightened, the, the Holy Spirit enlightened the disciples to go deeper and to understand the words of Christ. What had already been given, the Holy Spirit now gives the ability for them to remember, to understand, and to preach the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is one very basic thing that happened. But new dogmas were not preached, and they have never been preached. There's never been a new dogma preached. There's only been dogmas, in other words, the experience of the revelation, confirmed and further explained and the boundaries set so that everyone knows exactly what is meant and what's been passed down. It's all been passed down from the beginning. Once delivered the faith, not twice, not three times, not at every ecumenical council, not at Pentecost again. Once delivered the faith from Christ to the, to the apostles. <coughs> the revelation, which was given by Jesus, while well, being of itself complete, is, however, insufficient vis-a-vis -vis the final eschatological revelation of the second coming. This is very interesting. And I have to confess that this is the first time I think I've read this. And it's very provo provocative. Listen to what he says and don't misunderstand. The revelation which was given by Jesus while well, being of itself complete is, however, insufficient. Atelis is the Greek, I think. 
Atelis is maybe imperfect or insufficient. Uh, Eparchis, maybe, maybe it was Eparchis, I don't remember. Uh, insufficient vis-a-vis, in other words, with relate, related to, not insufficient of itself, but insufficient as it relates to what? The final eschatological revelation of the second coming. So again, you might say, well, are we contradicting ourselves? We said that with Pentecost was fulfilled, we said with the coming of Christ it was complete. No, because this is one of the same economy, one of the same revelation, one of the same continuous present of Christ. He didn't abandon us. We don't need to recreate the church. We don't need to think second and third time about the dogmas. He's constantly present. And now we're going to see that with regard to the final eschatological revelation of the second coming, when the Son of Man will be revealed in his glory, well, this revelation is yet to be is insufficient. It's not quite totally given, obviously. Second coming, we're going to have that uh, event which has yet to happen. So it's still, still, we're still waiting for it, right? The, the, the New Testament, then, although much fuller than the old, will nonetheless have the same fate if its teachings is compared to the future teaching, and it will be abolished as soon as that will be implemented. That's St. John Chrysostom talking. I'll have to get the quote for you. I don't have it. I can find it here if, you, if somebody's interested. Have it right here. Let me read that again. The New Testament, although much fuller than the old, obviously, right? We have a completion of the incarnation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, of the logos in and the Trinity in Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, and this is mind boggling, its teaching is when it's compared, if it's compared to the future teaching, in other words, what will be given to us at the second coming. It will be abolished as soon as that will be implemented. So the, the, the new heaven and the earth and the eternal kingdom is going to come in and take place of all the economy of salvation given to us for our salvation now between the first and the second coming. Now, it says in Corinthians, we know in part. Now we know in part. And we see through a glass darkly when, however, that which is perfect is come in the future age, that is, then that which is in part shall be done away. And then we shall see clearly and manifestly Christ in his full glory face to face. So that gives you an insight into what the difference is and how what we see now in part will then see clearly pointing to the second coming. All right, so that is our introductory. This is really the introduction to the book. We did this tonight. That's what we've, uh, been waiting for. I'm sure all of us have been rather waiting for it and like, eager to present it. It's the first of many chapters. You saw in our previous live stream the whole table of contents. If you haven't and you weren't at our previous live stream, go back and look at that toward the end of the live stream. We go through the whole table of contents. Uh, and so we're just just getting started here. Just a few first pages. I think now we're going to be starting. We finished page 46. Uh, we covered in this class tonight, uh, page 33, 4 to 46. And next week, we will have the Theophanias, the uh, revelations of God of the fleshless logo. In other words, we're going to go back to the pre incarnate logos of the Old Testament, and we're going to talk about creation, Adam and Eve, and, uh, and, and much more. Uh, but for tonight, that is. That is our, gonna, I think, going to set the stage for us as we go forward. A very good introduction, and thanks, thanks be to God for that. So we do have about 15 minutes before we end this, before we go to the question answer session. So we could answer one or two questions, perhaps. Uh, let me first say welcome to Constantine Lukopoulos. God bless you. Thank you for joining us and uh, supporting our work. And thank you to Piston Shack Motto. All right, donation for the book publishing of the Mystery of Christ. Thank you very much. $20 Canadian, it looks like, for the book. Well, we have begun in earnest. This is uh, uh, the fruit of the, about a, uh, I don't know, how many hours did it take me to translate that? I think it's probably eight hours, maybe, eight hours altogether to translate that. Um, and to put it together, well, all together, to put it together as a pre presentation and to translate, it took about eight hours. Believing the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God is literally Gnosticism. No, yes, there's a, there was, yes, that's 
it's a form of Gnosticism. There are many kinds of forms of Gnosticism, but yes, there were those who rejected the Old Testament God, insisted that this was a different God, Christ was a new God, uh, and they were pretty effective actually in, in, for a time in the second uh, end of the second and, and beginning of the third century. Uh, how can the angels be revealed something in time if they are eternal? Well, God became flesh, and there was a time when he became flesh, right? So he entered into time and gave us the flesh. And so they, they, don't, have the, they don't have the omnipotence or uh, omniscience of God. They don't see, they don't see uh, into the future. The angels don't know the future. Uh, the demons don't know the future, right? Only God knows and sees everything as if in the present tense. Uh, so the angels, although they were they're created and they will not uh, perish, they were created at one point, right? They didn't. There was a time when they did not exist, uh, and so there's there's the eternity of God and the eternity of the angels is not the same thing, right? The, one is without beginning; the other has a beginning. Uh, our souls also are not going to perish. Right? We're not going to cease to exist. Uh, so, uh, so that the angels have uh, limitations on their knowledge of things. Father, can you clarify that the existing one or the I am revelation of the Old Testament or Yahweh is Jesus Christ, correct? Does that mean Lord? Yes. Yes, of course. Yes. And the I am of Revelation, he says himself, uh, before Abraham, I am in, uh, in, the, in the gospel. So that is the identification. He is the pre-incarnate Logos. He is the, the angel of great counsel. He is the Lord of the Old Testament. Let's see if we have any questions perhaps submitted over in Crowdcast. If not, what we'll do is uh, make an announcement or two, and then we'll we'll wrap it up, although a bit late, a bit earlier than that it's hard to it's hard to gauge exactly how long uh, each section is going to be. So there's going to be times where we're going to be really pressed to get it done in an hour and a half. And there's going to be times when we're going to finish a little early. So this section, uh, as we go, I'll, I'll probably be able to gauge much better uh, exactly how many uh, slides and how much material we can cover in an hour and a half. So let me make an announcement or two before we cut off and we go to the question and answer session over. Uh, in the various platforms for all of you who uh, are uh, interested we do have an upcoming conference i should make that announcement it's getting closer and closer not far from us uh, we'd love to have you to join us at this conference this is uh, happening uh, in conjunction with the parish of saint michael the archangel in huntsville alabama and with the blessing of his grace bishop longing uh, of the Serbian Orthodox Archdiocese of Chicago. It's going to happen uh, on the 14th to the 16th of March, and we're going to have phenomenal speakers and a wonderful three days together, two and a half days, a divine service, a all-night vigil for the Eighth Ecumenical Council that is under Fotios, uh, written and translated, written by the Sisters of the Monastery of St. Uh, Stephen's on, and Meteora. And if you've seen our introduction, and you'll, you'll see it, I think, leaving here in a minute, I think you might see this. One of the one of the pictures shows the monastery of Saint Stephen as uh, going across, uh, and you can see it's Meteora. That monastery wrote the divine service that we translated for the feast of the Eighth Ecumenical Council under Saint Photios, recognized and accepted by the Church as an Eighth Ecumenical Council, contrary to the uh, ideas of some, unfortunately, who think that there's only seven. The church has always seen it eight, and and it's a mystery indeed how. Uh, we've come to the point in the 20th century to talk only about seven ecumenical councils. And that'll be taking place on Friday night. We'll have uh, seven speakers. Uh, Metropolitan Neophytos of Morphu will join us via live stream. Metropolitan Seraphim of Perios via live stream. Uh, we'll have uh, Father Philotios of Petrovoda in Romania join us. Uh, we have uh, the we have a paper which will be delivered from Father Anastasius Gotsopoulos in Patra, uh, God willing, he'll send us a paper. And we also have uh, participation of a, of a very uh, good scholar on St. Photios uh, from Austria, uh, uh, Theodore uh, Alexopoulos. Uh, we have Dr. 
David Ford from St. Tika on seminary uh, in the United States, Constantine, uh, Constantine Zalalas, a well-known uh, teacher and speaker uh, on orthodoxy in the United States, and Craig Tra Patrick Trulia. And we have the addition, uh, late addition father, Juhani Jacobsi from Florida. Uh, and so all of that together, maybe is that eight? I've, I've lost track. Uh, all of that together, plus uh, the divine services and a number of other surprises. We have a really big announcement. I don't think I have a card here though for it. Let me see. Do we have it now? All I'll do is I'll share it in the question and answer session right when we go. Uh, in the beginning, we have a new book that's coming out, and it'll be out in time, God willing, for the conference. So if you join us at the conference, you'll have first uh, opportunity to buy it. It is called The Orthodox Patristic. Uh, witness concerning Catholicism. It's a thousand fifty pages, and it is a compendium of everything that we could find, including many freshly new tra made translations from Greek concerning Catholicism in terms of from the fathers and from the conciliar tradition. So we have the lives of the saints that had to do with Catholicism, their writings, their teachings, conciliar decrees. And many other events and interesting uh, historical events that have to do with Catholicism. So, if you want to know what does the Orthodox Church teach regarding Catholicism, this will be the number one text. Unlike, I don't think there's any text anywhere in any language like this. It's a, it's an unprecedented uh, production, and we're very grateful that we're able to produce it and bring it to you. A number of people were involved. Uh, it was a collective effort, but. There were two or three who worked very, very hard uh, over a year and a half to, to bring this to bear, and it will be extremely helpful for all of those who are considering orthodoxy uh, and from uh, Catholicism, and it will be extremely helpful for all of us orthodox uh, to have the right criteria for what uh, the church has always taught and, and the saints believe concerning Catholicism. As we know in our day, there's talk of a, uh, a union, a reunion, a false union coming up, and so there needs to be a lot of vigilance and watchfulness as to what does the church really teach about Catholicism. Those are some of the announcements. We're really glad that you joined us. Uh, we will be seeing you at, at 740 on uh, the various uh, platforms. Check out the description below to join us for the question and answer session, and we'll see you soon. God bless. See you next week. Uh, Tuesday, we'll be joining you uh, from... Uh, for the Book of Revelation, as as always, right there, the Book of Revelation. Let's see if we can get that. No. Yeah, I don't have that. And and we will uh, be joining again next Thursday for this lecture series. God bless, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Oh, my God.